Hi there, this is Kiffer with week 5's lecture. So far in the course, Nate has introduced epidemiology and describes the impact of error and confounding in descriptive studies. On slide 2, you can see that we classify studies based on a number of study designs, and that some of these designs are relatively more powerful than others in shaping scientific belief. Over the next four weeks, we're going to apply what we've learned earlier in the course and consider how to critically assess the strengths and limitations of analytic research. As you will come to see, many strengths and limitations go back to the way in which any given study was designed, which is why it's important that we have a good sense of these designs. This week we will focus on cross-sectional and case control studies. Next week we will focus on cohorts. The week after that we will focus on some common study design modifications, and in week 8 we'll wrap up with some guidance on how to evaluate analytic research. On slide 3, we introduced when it is appropriate to carry out a cross-sectional design. It's important to remember that regardless of where a study design falls on the evidence pyramid, it has a function and purpose. The primary purpose of cross-sectional designs is to assess prevalence, and for epidemiological studies where the distribution of disease in a population is the primary research question, the cross-sectional study provides uh, a useful analytic tool. On slide four, I want you to imagine for a moment that you're a baker epidemiologist studying the fruit loaf. As a first step, you probably want to start with some descriptive statistics such as assessing the prevalence of each color of fruit pieces, such as red, orange, green, and it looks like black, and perhaps examining their distribution in the fruit loaf. As you can see on slide five, we can estimate that about 17% of the fruit pieces in the cake are red, 17% are orange, 27% are green, and 40% are black. That is of course assuming that our cross section, i.e. the slice, is representative of the rest of the loaf, or in other words, that we have a random sample. In addition to providing descriptive statistics such as prevalence, cross-sectional studies are also useful uh, to measure the association between two observed factors. Take for instance the association between color and being on the bottom. You may have noticed that green fruit pieces are on the bottom, while zero red or zero orange and one black piece is on the bottom. I hypothesize that this is because the green fruit pieces are heavier and therefore sunk to the bottom while the loaf was baking. Before testing this hypothesis, however, we should evaluate whether there really are more green pieces on the bottom compared to other colors. On slide 6, we explore this question by filling in this 2x2 two two contingency table. As you can see, a contingency table compares two factors by segmenting the study population contingent on each of those two factors. For example, cell A represents the number of green pieces on the bottom, cell B represents the number of green pieces not on the bottom, cell C represents the number of green pieces on the bottom, or non-green pieces on the bottom, and cell D represents the number of non-green pieces not on the bottom. Using this basic table, we can now calculate a number of interesting measures. For instance, on slide 7, we calculate the prevalence difference. This measure tells us the difference in the prevalence of factor 2 between each possible option in factor 1. You can follow the math and find that in our fruit loaf example, about 37.5% of the green pieces were on the bottom and 4.5% of non-green pieces, resulting in a prevalence difference of about 0.33, simply minusing 37.5 from uh, 4.5. And you can try recalculating each measure here uh, by examining whether black pieces were more or less prevalent on the bottom and recreating that table and going through these steps again. Next on slide eight, we have the prevalence ratio, which provides a nice summary on the relationship between the prevalence of factor two by those with and without factor one. In our fruit loaf example, the prevalence ratio is characterized as the prevalence of green pieces on the bottom divided by the prevalence of non-green pieces on the bottom. If the prevalence of factor 2, in this case being on the bottom, is equal between those two groups, the green and the non-green, then the prevalence ratio would equal 1. If the prevalence of factor 2 being on the bottom is lower in those with factor 1, the prevalence ratio would be less than 1. And if the pre uh, prevalence of factor 2 is higher in those that are green or with factor 1, 
As is the case in our example, the ratio would be greater than 1, and you can see it's about 8.25. Finally, on slide 9, we present the prevalence odds ratio, which represents the odds that a green piece would be on the bottom compared to the odds of a non-green piece being on the bottom. On slide 10, I provide an illustration of the difference between the prevalence ratio and the prevalence odds ratio. As you can see, in a standard deck of cards, there are two black suits and two red suits. Each suit has 13 cards, resulting in a 52-card deck. The probability of drawing a red card at random is 50% because there are 26 red cards out of 52. Meanwhile, the probability of drawing a club is 25% because there are 13 clubs out of 52 cards. You can see from these two examples that probabilities represent the number of events for a given outcome divided by the number of all possible outcomes. For example, if I'm drawing based on color, there are two outcomes, red and black. If I'm drawing based on suit, there are four outcomes, hearts, diamonds, spades, and clubs. And if I'm drawing based on face value, there are 13 possible outcomes, aces, twos to tens, and then jack, queen, and king. This results in probabilities of 50% for color, 25% if you're drawing on uh, suit, and 7.7% if you're drawing on face value. However, Odds represent the number of events for a given outcome divided by the number of events for each other outcome. For example, the odds of drawing a red card is 1 to 1 because there are an equal number of red and black cards. Meanwhile, the odds for drawing a club is 1 to 3 because there are three times as many non-clubs as there are clubs. And finally, the odds for drawing a king are 1 to 12 because there are 12 times as many non-kings as there are kings. With that out of the way, on slide 11, I list the strengths and limitations of cross-sectional studies. Among these, cross-sectional studies are particularly ineffective at assessing the temporal ordering of events, detecting rare events and exposures, such that you wouldn't find very many of them in a, any given slice of bread, and because there is no follow-up, uh, so they don't yield relative risk or incidence data, which is, are often the things that epidemiologists are interested in. So this is where the case control studies come in. You can see that on slide 12, that case control studies allow us to do a little bit more. They are good for rare outcomes. Uh, we can examine things like vaccine effectiveness. We can examine how people in a study versus those not in a study, how uh, prevention is different for them. Or you could look at something like disease outbreak and see, look at who got sick and who didn't get sick and trace back and see if you can identify the thing that made them sick. On slide 13, I provide an adorable diagram for this type of study. As you can see, case control studies start by sampling a group of individuals or ferrets with an outcome whom we call cases and a second group of individuals without the outcome whom we call controls. Then, each group reports whether or not they had been exposed prior to being sick. For instance, I might ask my two ferrets whether they ate too much kibble before getting sleepy, and then calculate the odds of getting sleepy for the cases and controls to determine whether eating too much kibble is associated with getting sleepy. In short, case control studies allow us to estimate the risk of an outcome given an exposure that occurred previously in time by recruiting those with and without the outcome and probing back in time to determine whether the group with the outcome was more likely to have had the exposure than the group without the outcome. On slide 14, you can see this is accomplished in much the same way that we would examine prevalence in a cross-sectional study using a two by two table. However, as shown on slide 15, the primary measure for a case control study is the odds ratio. You may recognize the general formula for this ratio from the one presented for cross-sectional studies, and indeed they're the same. However, in a case control study, you are interested in measuring associations rather than just prevalence, which is why you recruited a group of cases and a group of controls in the first place, to determine if a particular exposure was associated with the outcome of interest that you've recruited on. Therefore, the odds ratio is much more powerful of an analytic tool that assesses an association between having an outcome and having been exposed, 
the emphasis here being on the temporal ordering of exposure and outcome events. However, starting on slide 16, you can see that case control studies are subject to considerably more potential sources of bias. Mainly, it's because you're trying to do a more complex thing than just look at prevalence. If you recall, in cross-sectional studies, you are primarily worried about sampling and measurement error, or in other words, making sure your cross-section is representative of the study population and that your measure accurately captures the variables of interest. But with case control studies, you selected individuals based on a particular disease state. Therefore, in addition to representatives, you must be sure to that your recruitment of cases and controls is not dependent in any way on the exposure of interest. An example of this is Berkson bias, which was when cases and controls are recruited from hospital settings. As you can imagine, hospitals are a rich source of data because we have people who have a diagnosis and people who don't have a diagnosis, and so they seem like kind of an ideal place to recruit. This is much easier than, say, going door to door or sending emails or flyers or calling. However, while you might expect that individuals are in a hospital for any number of outcomes, certain exposures make it more likely for a patient to be hospitalized. Take, for example, the association between respiratory illness and poor mobility, which is kind of a classic example. You can imagine that having both mobility and respiratory issues might increase your chance for hospitalization, and thus those with both of these conditions would be more likely to be sampled into your study than individuals with only one or the other. This, in effect, increases the strength of the association between respiratory diseases and poor mobility when in fact the association might not exist or just might not be as strong as is reported. Further on slide 17, observation and classification biases are introduced. Observation bias occurs from error in observations such as interviewer or recall bias, and classification bias occurs from non-random or differential misclassifications in either exposure or disease states. Looking at this timeline, Imagine that four individuals are exposed to a disease-causing agent. Participant 1 experiences a short induction period. An induction period is the time between exposure and the onset of disease. And they're interviewed soon after they become symptomatic. Participant 2 experiences long induction and latency periods and is also interviewed soon after they become symptomatic. Participant 3, on the other hand, is still in their induction period when they are interviewed and so they don't technically have the disease yet. And participant four experiences a short induction period and is in their latency period when they are interviewed. So they may not know that they have the disease, even though a test would detect it. First, consider how these conditions might impact a person's ability to recall specific exposures. Participant one is probably more likely to remember the exposure because their symptoms arose soon after they were exposed. Participant 2 is probably less likely to remember the exposure because symptoms arose such a long time after they were exposed. And participants 3 and 4 may not recall the exposure because they have not experienced any symptoms and thus not put a lot of thought into potential exposures. A classic example of this is like when children or mothers of children have health issues with their ch child. They put a lot more thought into what potentially they might have done to cause that health issue, and therefore they're more likely to remember potential exposures than people who maybe don't have a child with some sort of uh, health concern. You could also imagine that interviewer bias causes interviewers to probe recently diagnosed individuals differently than non-diagnosed or long-term survivors. Next, consider how these conditions might impact a test for the disease. Participants one, two, and four would be classified as diseased, while participant three is not yet diseased but was still exposed and will in fact eventually become diseased. Another thing to consider would be if a test is not available and participants are merely self-reporting their disease, you could see that only participants one and two would be able to report symptoms. And you can imagine that depending how the question is worded, somebody who is symptomatic but has not been formally diagnosed might misreport themselves as being unaffected. The thing to remember about each of these sources of bias 
is that they only impact your results if they have a differential effect on both cases and controls. In other words, if the effect is the same or randomly distributed, they will cancel each other out. This is referred to as non-differential bias, and while it's still not desirable, it's not quite as problematic as differential bias would be. With that, we conclude today's lecture on slide 18, wherein I provide a short list of the strengths and limitations of case control studies. In next week's lecture, we will examine how to address some of these limitations, but with the strengths and limitations for both case control and cross-sectional studies in mind, the main takeaway from today's lecture is the importance of identifying not only the appropriate study design to answer a specific research question, but also the importance of considering how measurements, limitations, and potential source of biases affect the conclusions made from these specific study designs. In the remaining slides, I provide some useful practice material that I recommend you work on in preparation for your next midterm. And with that, I'll leave you to it until next week when we cover cohort designs and consider the impact of confounding and effect modification within their context. Thanks for listening to the lecture and I look forward to chatting with you on the discussion boards.